um, and do we really understand that? So take it away, Sharon. Thanks very much. How much do we need to know about nature and the interconnections of nature to live sustainably? Who knows and who needs to know? And these questions have concerned scientists and educators for a long time now and still do. Should it only be the experienced and highly trained scientists who understand how the earth functions or all citizens? The thing is, a practical knowledge and understanding of how the earth functions has always been core to human survival. To know what to eat, when and how and how much to take and where to find it are all, are all involving basic ecological literacy. But now the world is a lot more complex and urbanised and so are the questions like how and where to develop vast human settlements, how and where to to grow large amounts of food, how to manage land and water, how to maintain healthy ecosystems that support us. So along with the complexity of the questions, the concern is that we, that's the general we, don't know that much anymore, that we're not informed citizens, that we know too little about how the earth functions and how systems interconnect to make sustainable decisions. And it's argued that the fundamental sense of connection, and we've heard this here in this conference, um, that people have or used to have with the natural world is disappearing in many places. So I thank many people for their assistance and support in this work. So ecological literacy concerns the principal way that we make sense of the interacting systems that support life on Earth, our home. And as we know, the Greek word for home is oikos, or the Greek word for ecology is oikos, meaning home. So it involves the capacity to know and understand places as ecological systems um, and how they function and connect with other systems. So this involves both local place-based knowledge plus a knowledge of the wider global systems and how they interconnect, including the interface with human society. Understanding the world as a network, in other words. So therefore, knowledge and understanding is a very important part of ecological literacy. It facilitates the development of emotional connections with the natural world, and we cannot love what we do not know. And as Thomas More famously says, when the heart is involved, care of the place will follow. So weaving together attachment to place with knowledge and understanding of place and that the relationships with other places is vital for effectively managing the environmental challenges we face. So it's a very large subject indeed, and this will be a very fast journey through a very tiny bite-sized chunk. And my particular interest has been in how to measure what adult people know and understand about nature in South Australia in particular, and adults since we're the one making the crucial decisions and will be doing so for some time. So we developed a measurement instrument, noting that very few such instruments exist in the world to measure um, uh, ecological literacy and have been applied to adult communities. So we worked with senior scientists and educators. Uh, we considered key ecological principles. We developed questions about local and national and global systems. And we created a relatively sensitive analysis so that we had correct, or it's a variable credit system of correct, partially correct, and incorrect answers. It was subjected to an ongoing testing and refining process, and we were able to establish levels of ecological literacy that accounted for a very wide range of knowledge and understanding. So the instrument is capable of distinguishing between the highly eco-literate and the less eco-literate, and therefore able to provide an indicative, indicative-only measure of eco-literacy within the SA community. It was distributed online to a diverse range of adults um, and by its very nature, because it took time and effort to complete, it was self-selecting. So we're not talking a representative sample. We're starting at a relatively high level of interest and engagement in the subject matter. We received 1,010 valid responses, so more than that, but valid. And as you can see, most participants scored in the high and the moderate ranges. And you can see that 45 scored extremely high and 53 in the low 
and, ex well, and, and very low ranges. So this is somewhat encouraging, but not unexpected given the population sample. We also collected sociodemographic and psychographic data and the responses were quantitatively analysed. So what did we find? So data here, oops, I've gone too far. Data is, ex something's missing. This is really annoying. Oh well. Basically, oh no, it's me, it's me. These is a summary of all the characteristics with, with the statistically significant differences. Now there are <clears throat> many fascinating stories here but I'm going to try and whiz through just the ones in green. So all of these showed significant differences. These data is expressed in range. The range, this, these are all the respondents. This is the mean. And then these large diamonds are the 90% confidence, confidence interval of the average response. And the end number is the number of participants. And all the graphs are similar, so you, once you've understood that, that should be fairly simple. The gender story is pretty interesting. Males performed significantly better than females, and this was shocking to some people. Me. However, this accords with a lot of other studies in the areas of scientific and environmental knowledge in other countries. And the reasons are potentially complex. But they include, include things like a difference in the level of involvement in things scientific between males and females, both in, it, in their education and at home, but also a relationship with childhood experiences. So it's been shown that as children, or until recently at least, boys tended to roam further than girls, they explored more of their environments, and they spent more time doing so. Education. So education is also highly correlated with ecological literacy. This is also corroborated in other studies overseas. But note that the range shows that even people with very little education past school can do really, really well, and that people with doctoral degrees and postgraduate studies can do really, really badly. Um, so this indicates that while education is very important, and there's no, no doubting that, it is certainly not the only important factor. And when we correlate education and gender, we find that the gender differences disappears. There's the year 10s and 11s. The significant differences disappear as you go up the education scale until at doctorate level, there is no significant difference anymore. Age, the most ecologically literate age group is the 35 to 45 year old range, but very closely followed by all of the middle age groups. And the theories for this in, include things like that science and environment, the interest in those things peak in the, middle age, in the middle age groups. And also that ecological literacy develops over time. So ta time allows for an accumulation of diverse life experiences that contribute to your ecological knowledge and understanding. Where people grew up proved to be very interesting. So up until about your teenage years, it's shown that if you grew up in a small town or village, you were actually significantly higher scores than if you grew up in a large medium town or a city. But the rural properties were very close to the small towns and villages. So what is it about growing up in small towns that lead to higher knowledge and understanding? And what is it about growing up in cities, for example, that lead to less? Well, one theory is that knowledge and understanding of place is an important part of ecological literacy and small towns, more close-knit, people are more connected with their environments, with their agriculture, with their plants and animals, their climate systems. So they're more engaged with how their nature works. And in cities, often those characteristics and dynamics are hidden or even eliminated, and there is little engagement with those things. So this leads to a very quick look at some of the psychographic stories, which cover the activities, interests, and values. So time proves to be very important. Spending time in nature, regardless of the activity, resulted in higher scores. And we found that one to two days a week spent in a park, garden, or nature reserve was the significant difference. And that spending any more time than that really didn't make any more difference. 
Volunteering, a very good example of highly significant differences between each group. So the more volunteering in environmental fields, the higher the average scores. And this is not unexpected, but it's a compelling result. Um, because research shows that learning through participation and volunteering is a very powerful source of the type of learning that encompasses the less formal types of education and learning. And if you heard Greg Kerr's talk yesterday about citizen science in the Eyre Peninsula, he made the point that the participants who were involved in a lot of that monitoring said to him that they were much more knowledgeable about their environment as a result of that. We looked at how people value nature and this question was about the importance of spending time outdoors to their enjoyment of life. And this was another extraordinary result um, achieved in the scores for people for whom spending time outdoors was extremely important to their enjoyment of life. And you see that steady trend. The more enjoyment of life is about being outdoors, the higher the scores. We looked at the importance of nature in the current household where people were living and we can see once again that trend. The more important it is in the current household, the higher the average scores. We did some comparisons too between that very high group of 45, that extremely high group, and that lowest group of the 53 people. Now, at a glance, these are just some of the socio-demographic characteristics of the extremely high group. So you can see they tend to be male, they tend to be in this 35 to 54 year old age group, they have postgraduate qualifications, and they grew up in small towns, villages, or on rural properties. We also had a look, and this is just something I popped in because the difference in the high-low group between what they studied at school. And of all the science-related subjects, the physics-chemistry combination was the only one that made a significant difference in this group. And the theory here is that the system's thinking thinking in terms of connectedness and relationships and patterns and context learned in these science subjects is highly relevant to understanding nature and living systems. So the psychographics of the high-low group as well, we find once again that importance of nature in both the current and the childhood households was extremely high. The importance of spending time outdoors for the enjoyment of life was extremely high. The average time spent outside one to two days a week or more. And volunteer environmental activity in the last five years, very, very high. I'm going to, we did a lot of work on the perceived contributors to people's knowledge and understanding, um, but I'm going to move past that. We don't really have time. So look, as conclusions, ecological literacy can be measured. I'm sure there are many other ways of measuring it besides this one, but we've shown that it can be measured. And that some groups and individuals are obviously more ecologically literate than others, that's not rocket science. But there's a range, a vast range of factors that contribute to that. And they include your formal and your informal kinds of correlations. And that the development of ecological literacy is complex and it reflects those diverse relationships that everyone has with their environment and their world. So we've explored and illuminated some of these relationships. And you can see there are different ways in which people can know and understand and connect with nature. So our results paint a quite interesting picture and perhaps raise more questions than answers, um, especially in relation to how to grow informed adult communities with the capacity to understand ecological systems. But what we've attempted to create is a foundation on which to build efforts to further develop ecological literacy amongst both our citizenry and our governing bodies. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, there's exploring the possibilities, they're acknowledging education, science, how we teach, facilitating contact with nature, opportunities to enjoy and value, and looking at the barriers. And I just want to leave you with some words from some of the gurus in this field. Um, Fritjof Capra and Michael Stone so essentially here we're talking about the survival of humanity and that eco-literacy is critical for everyone, whether at work or at school or in the continuing education of life. And as Carl Sagan says, our species needs and deserves 
a citizenry with minds wide awake and a basic understanding of how the world works. And as Albert Einstein says, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. Thank you.